it's time we head back into the cellar. On February 9, 2004, Maura Murray, a 21-year-old nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, disappeared under mysterious circumstances. On that day, she got in her car and left campus for reasons that are still not entirely clear. Prior to leaving, she fabricated a story and then emailed her professors and work supervisors, stating that she needed to take a week off due to a family emergency. At around 7.30 p.m., following a minor accident, Morris car would be found on a winding rural road in Haverhill, New Hampshire. Her personal belongings were left in the car, but Mora was nowhere to be found. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. This is the disappearance of Maura Murray. Maura Murray was born on May 4, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts. She grew up in a very close-knit family and had four siblings, three brothers and a sister, Fred Murray Jr., Kathleen Murray, Julie Murray, and a half-brother named Kurt. Her parents, Fred and Lori Murray, would divorce when Maura was six years old. After the divorce, Maura would primarily live with her mother. Maura attended Whitman Hanson Regional High School, where she was an accomplished student and athlete. She participated in various sports, excelling in track and field. Maura was overall an accomplished student, known for her intelligence and ambition. After graduating from high school, Maura would attend the United States Military Academy at West Point. There, she would study chemical engineering for three semesters before transferring to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to pursue a degree in nursing. Now, there's been a lot of speculation in regards to why Maura left West Point. Unfortunately, there is no clear-cut answer, but I will bring forth what information there is on this. According to school transcripts obtained by the author James Renner, Moore's grades were severely suffering prior to her transfer out of West Point. On top of this, there had been a reported incident where Mora was caught stealing from a store at Fort Knox, which subsequently led to a West Point Honor Code violation. It is believed that she was given the option at this point to transfer out of West Point. No matter what the full truth is, Mora appeared to have been miserable at West Point, and a change is what she ultimately sought after. But sadly, trouble would continue to follow Mora at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. In November of 2003, Mora was caught and admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants near campus. The charge would be given a continuance in December of 2003 and was set to be dismissed after three months of good behavior. One particular location Mora called frequently was a Domino's Pizza near campus. Now, there have been many theories out there that Mora may have been seeing someone who worked at the Domino's Pizza, but nothing has been corroborated as of the writing of this. Now, at this point in the story, we will dive into the days leading up to Mora's disappearance. February 5th, 2004, Mora was working at her on-campus security job. At around 1 to 1.20 a.m., Mora's supervisor would escort Mora back to her dorm room. She described Mora as being completely zoned out and clearly dealing with emotional stress. But what led to this very moment? Let's analyze what we know. Between 10.10 and 10.38 p.m., Mora spoke with her eldest sister, Kathleen, on the phone. According to Kathleen herself, this conversation was as normal as can be. The only thing Kathleen can point to that would potentially upset Mora is the fact that Kathleen had just left rehab and Kathleen's husband had decided to drive her to a liquor store before bringing her home. Mora's supervisor also stated that Mora had said something along the lines of my sister during her state of emotional stress that evening. Now, I personally do not believe this phone call had anything to do with Mora's emotional state later on in the evening. 12.07 a.m. to 12.14 a.m. Mora had a phone call with her then boyfriend, Bill Rausch. What was this conversation ultimately about? I firmly believe that if we knew all the details, we may have more answers as to what ultimately motivated Mora to take her trip to New Hampshire. 12.20 a.m. Patrit Bassey was discovered to have been hit and run over by a car. 
To this day, the car and driver have not been found. Now, there are tons of theories connecting Mora to Patrit Vassi. To this day, there has been no proven connection made. But it is an interesting theory. We ultimately don't know the cause of Mora's catatonic-like state that night, but a hit-and-run accident could certainly push someone to an emotional breaking point. Could Mora have hit Patrit Vassi? Or was the phone call to her boyfriend, Bill Roush, the catalyst for what would come? At this point, I think the phone call with Bill is more likely the culprit, but we won't rule anything out. So now let's get to the rest of the timeline. Saturday, February 7th. Mora's father, Fred Murray, arrives in Amherst to go car shopping. Fred would make numerous stops on his way to ATMs, taking out $400 at a time before arriving in Amherst with a total of $4,000 in cash. At 6 p.m. that evening, Mora and Fred would have dinner together at the Amherst Brewing Company. After dinner, Mora, her father, and her friend Kate traveled to a liquor store to pick up alcohol. They then drop Fred off at the hotel he was staying at, and Mara borrows her father's brand new Toyota Corolla for the evening. Mora and her friends would attend a party for most of that night. Now this party is another area of contention, as it has been close to impossible to find out who attended this party. Author James Renner theorized that this party may have been a going away party for Mora, but at the end of the day it's another theory with very little evidence to substantiate. Sunday, February 8th at 3.30 a.m. Mora has an accident in her father Fred's Toyota. The officer that arrives on scene ends up letting Mora go with no charges, and she gets a ride from the tow truck driver to Fred's hotel room. One of the weirdest aspects of all this, aside from the officer not giving Mora a DUI, is the fact that it has been reported that a police cadet was the one to call in Mora's accident at this time. Yet to this very day, we don't know the name of this cadet, and as far as we know, no one has ever interviewed this cadet. It begs the question, did this cadet happen upon Mora's accident, or was the cadet potentially hanging out with Mora that evening? If anyone out there has any further information on this, please reach out because I would love to gather more information in regards to what happened on the morning of February 8, 2004. At 5 a.m. that morning, a phone call is placed from Fred's cell phone to Bill Roush. According to reports, this phone call was placed by Mora, but I have a lot of questions in regards to this phone call and whether or not Mora or Fred place this call. Monday, February 9th. Just after midnight, Mora places phone call seeking information for renting a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. There are reports that she stayed up until 4 a.m. looking at rentals, but there has never been any evidence found that she actually booked a rental anywhere. At 12.55 p.m. that afternoon, Mora once again continues her search to rent a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. At 1 p.m., Mora emails her boyfriend, Bill Roush, that she doesn't want to talk, will call later. Love you, stud. At 1.13 p.m., Mora calls her classmate, Aaron O'Neill, about returning some clothes to her. At 1.30 p.m., Mora emails her professors and her work supervisor about a death occurring in the family. This death in the family was completely fabricated by Mora. At 2.05 p.m., Mora calls 1-800-GO-STO which is for reservation information in Stowe, Vermont. At 2.18 p.m., Mora calls her boyfriend, Bill Roush. At 3 p.m., Mora leaves the campus in her extremely unreliable vehicle that Fred was hoping to replace for her. At 3.15 p.m., Mora takes $280 out of her account at an ATM. At 3.43 p.m., Mora goes to a liquor store and purchases liquor for her trip. This now leads us to 7.27 p.m when Faith Westman places a phone call to the police about Mora's accident, which she saw from a window within her home. Now, there was a theory brought forth by Art and Maggie on the Oxygen series, The Disappearance of Mora Murray. This theory was that there was an hour of time unaccounted for in Mora's trip to the accident site. After doing my own research, I don't believe there is a full missing hour. One thing that isn't always taken into account is the fact that Mora's vehicle was running down a cylinder. I have experienced driving a vehicle on three instead of four cylinders, and I can say that it's a struggle. I believe the issues with her car, along with her stop to get gas at some point not long prior to her accident, can account for some of the missing time that Art and Maggie talk about. Also, James Renner made the same drive Mora did as well, and I believe he had roughly a 45 minute window of time that was unaccounted for. 
I believe that Renner's drive was the more accurate one, and accounting for the issues Mora's car had along with stopping for gas and the fact that Mora would have been taking her time while also drinking on the drive, I just don't believe there's a large amount of missing time to account for in all of this. Now, before we continue any farther, let's go ahead and dive into Mora's significant other at the time, Mr. Bill Roush. At the time of Mora's disappearance, Bill Roush was a lieutenant in the army stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. There has been a ton of speculation about Bill over the years. Some people to this very day believe that Bill had something to do with Mora's disappearance. Now, according to reports, Bill was nowhere near New Hampshire at the time of Mora's accident. But I believe that Bill had something to do with why Mora was in New Hampshire on that fateful day. According to family of Mora's, her relationship with Bill was heading towards its end. Mora's sister Julie even stated that she encouraged Mora to move on from this toxic relationship. The narrative that Bill and his mother spun after Mora's disappearance about how they were planning to get married, etc., I believe it was a way to positively spin a narrative, and the truth was much darker than the one the media was given at the time of Mora's disappearance. There are reports that Bill was unfaithful to Mora. While there have also been reports that Mora may have been unfaithful to Bill as well, there has also been a lot of speculation that Bill was controlling and could be verbally abusive. Ultimately, we don't have a lot of factual evidence to drive the narrative in one direction. But what is alarming is that Bill Roush was recently facing a felony third degree sexual abuse charge for an incident that occurred with a female co worker back in 2011. From what has been reported, he pushed his female co-worker up against a desk and pressed his erection into her backside. There's also a report that he pushed the same woman down an escalator. Ultimately, he would accept a plea deal with a potential for 180 days in jail. I don't feel like this was punishment enough for the crimes that he committed. Also, behavior like this leads me to question what else this man is and was capable of. Could he be a prime suspect in Mora's disappearance? On top of all that, no evidence has ever been given to 100% verify where Bill Roush was the night Mora disappeared. Numerous attempts have been made to gather plane tickets or any kind of record to show that Bill made the trip from Oklahoma to New Hampshire. Ultimately, this puts Bill firmly on the list of suspects within this case. Now let's go ahead and dive back into the night Mora disappeared. As we dive into this, I do want to make a quick statement. Yes, I am aware of all the conflicting timelines and information, so when it comes to me laying all this information out, I'm going to try and touch on everything to the best of my ability. Starting with Faith Westman's call to the police at 7.27pm. Now, according to the police, this was the first notice the police were given about Mora's accident. Now, the timeline leading up to the accident, very little information is known, so for now we will dive into what we have available and then I will circle back on some theories that have been discussed. Faith Westman reported a car facing the wrong way on the side of the road just past the Weathered Barn, a local antique store. She also made two other statements while on the phone with the police that raised more questions than answers. The first statement was that she can see a man in Morris' car smoking a cigarette. However, there is no mention of recovering any cigarette butts from the crime scene. She is also reported as mentioning a flurry of activity near the trunk while on the phone with the police dispatcher. Neither of these statements can be 100% confirmed nor denied. What I find further interesting is that if you look through Faith Westman's 911 transcript, any mention of the flurry of activity or man with a cigarette appears to have been redacted, which begs the ultimate question, why? Now, after the Westmans placed their phone call to the police, Butch Atwood, a bus driver that lives right up the road from where Mora's car was, stopped in his bus and spoke with Mora briefly. According to Butch, Mora was in her car with the lights off and the car was facing the wrong direction on the road. According to Butch, he spoke with Mora briefly and asked if she needed help. She told Butch that she had already called AAA and that she did not need any help from him. This was an odd answer as Butch was well aware that there is zero cell service in this area something that remains true to this very day. Butch then left the scene and finished the short drive to his house. At 7.46 p.m., the Atwood residence would place a phone call to the police. Now, according to reports, Officer Cecil Smith would arrive on scene shortly around the time the Atwoods placed their phone call at 7.49 p.m. This is where the timeline begins to fall apart, though. A woman known as Witness A drove by the scene that night. 
It is believed that she passed around 7.40 p.m. and saw Mora's car along with the police SUV. According to Witness A, SUV 001 passed her twice with its blue lights on. The first time was before the sharp left-hand turn on Goose Lane, and the second time was several minutes later around the intersection of Goose Lane and Route 112. If her report is correct, this places the police on site far earlier than what's been reported. At the same time, this opens up another question. According to Butch Atwood, he could see Mora's car from the driveway at his house. It is believed he parked his school bus and waited a few minutes before going into his house as he usually finishes his paperwork in the bus at the end of the day. So this opens up another question. Why would Butch call the police at around 746 if at that point the police may have already been on site for upwards of six minutes? I looked deeper into Witness A's timeline and according to her story in her cell phone record, her passing the scene at around 7.40 p.m. does make logical sense, and in no way does she come across as someone who's just trying to insert herself into the case for the hell of it. As you can see already, the biggest issue with this case is the fact that we don't have a concrete timeline. But what we do know for certain is whatever happened to Mora happened between 7.30 and 7.49 p.m. If you believe in Witness A's account of that night, then the timeline shrinks to roughly 7.30 to 7.40 p.m. Another detail is the fact that Witness A placed the police SUV on scene while Cecil Smith and Trooper Monaghan placed the police cruiser on scene. Could this be a case of misremembering over time? Perhaps, but I find the conflicting reports amongst the police and witnesses to be alarming. But for now, let's go ahead and continue. The officer first on scene was Cecil Smith. According to Smith, he checked the vehicle to see if anyone was hurt prior to calling it in. Within four minutes, he put out a be on the lookout for a 5'7 female on foot. Around this time, State Trooper John Monahan arrived and spoke briefly to Officer Smith. Butch Atwood would travel up the road while Officer Monahan would travel along some of the roads back the way Mora had come in order to see if they could locate her. At the crime scene, Officer Smith would notice red splashes in the snow. Now, I've looked through the police transcripts in detail and I have found more inconsistencies within the reporting. According to Cecil Smith, Mora's car was locked and he did not enter it. Also according to Officer Smith, he did not discover the cup of wine with soda in it that Mora had been drinking from until the tow truck arrived and began to tow Mora's car away. He stated he had found the cup under her car. The problem with this statement is that it doesn't line up with Trooper Monahan's account. Trooper Monahan has stayed true to his account from the very get-go, and he stated that he pulled up and spoke to Cecil Smith for a couple of minutes. In that conversation, Cecil Smith stated, there's a box of wine in here, and it looks like she's been filling up a soda bottle with wine. This comes across as an egregious error within Cecil's report on what happened that night. When Trooper Monahan arrived on scene, the tow truck was not on site as of yet. Also. Based on what Cecil stated, it sounds like not only was he looking in Mora's car, but he had clearly found her cup of alcohol long before the tow truck had arrived on scene. On top of John Monahan and Cecil Smith's conflicting reports, Witness A also claimed that when she drove by the scene, the car door to Mara's car was wide open. Now, normally when looking into an investigation, you want to give the benefit of the doubt that some details can end up being reported incorrectly. My biggest issue is the fact that there are numerous details in Cecil Smith's reporting from that night that simply don't seem to add up. If you would like to dive deeper into the full transcripts and everything, I highly recommend you check out the website the107degree.com and that is spelled T-H-E-107-degree-D-E-G-R-E-E.com. I will also link it in the description box below. There you can find police reports and transcripts and overall some really good breakdowns of the timeline and inconsistencies found throughout. Now ultimately, the night would end with the police believing that whoever had been driving was intoxicated and that they had simply run off to avoid receiving a DUI. What's alarming though is the vehicle was clearly in an accident. The airbags were deployed and there was a crack to the windshield which all reports believe occurred from within the inside of the vehicle. There were red flags everywhere that ultimately should have been followed through on, but sadly, the car would be towed and the search would end for the night. While Mora 
would never be seen or heard from again. So what happened to Maura Murray? On the next episode, I will dive more into some theories and speculation and give my overall thoughts on the case. I want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in to another episode. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you all on the next episode of The Cellar. Thank you.